in New York, Professor Chandler studied at Cornell University, where he got his BA in 1962 with postgraduate studies in France from 62 to 64, notably at the Institute of Political Science Paris, and then the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, where he got his PhD in 1971. He held a previous appointment as Professor of Political Science at McMaster University in Canada. He also previously served as a guest professor at Tumbingen and Oldenburg Universities. In 2017 to 2019, he was visiting scholar at the American University in Paris. He has been an observer of all French presidential elections since 1981 and all German elections since 1976. In 2007, 2008, he held the directorship of the University of California Education Abroad Program in Bordeaux, Toulouse, France. He currently serves on the advisory board of the UCEAP program. His publications in com uh, comparative politics include questions of institutional design, federalism, political parties, and elections with primary focus on European and North American experiences. Let's welcome now William Chandler, Professor Emeritus, Department of Political Science. Take it away, Bill. Okay, well, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, uh, this is an exciting topic for me. I hope it is for all of you who are joining us. Uh, uh, presidential elections in France are always important. Uh, this one was especially so, in, in my opinion, and uh, that's what we want to talk about today. Um, so I think we should get started. There's a lot to talk about, and I would like to leave time for questions uh, at the end. Um, so, and you will, you will be handling the slides if I ask you to uh, move on to the next one. You're, you have that uh, from yes, your Yes, Ken Yen is doing it for us. Yeah, a chance to Excellent, okay. All right, well, let's, uh, let's quickly switch to slide number two to get uh, started. Uh, here is our uh, victorious uh, incumbent candidate. Um, this was uh, not a big surprise that he won, but it's how he won and how well he won or how well he didn't win um, that is of great interest to us. Uh, I should say, uh, unlike in America, where usually first term presidents do get reelected, in France, that's a bigger question mark. In fact, both of his predecessors failed to do so. So this is the first time since uh, 2002 that an incumbent has been reelected. At that time, it was uh, Jacques Chirac. Uh, so um, Ma Macron uh, is starting his second term. This is a five-year term, so he will have served when he's done 10 years. Uh, the Constitution now provides that uh, a president uh, cannot serve more than two consecutive terms. But my reading of that, and I think everyone else's, is that he still could serve a third term after sitting out a term, uh, much in the way that Putin did in, in Russia. Um, we, we don't know about that yet, but we're pretty sure that he's going to be uh, in office for the next five years. When he leaves office at that time, he'll still be a young man. He'll only be 49, uh, which is often an age, uh, an age at which somebody starts to get into higher politics. Let's go, let's move on uh, quickly to um, slide three. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this because I think many of you already know it, uh, but uh, uh, it's important to understand how French presidents do get elected. It's a two ballot system. Uh, two ballot voting is not unknown in the United States, although it's somewhat rare, um, but in France, it's very common. In fact, it's pervasive in many elections. Uh, so the, the, first, uh, the first ballot is a, is, a, is a runoff type election among all the, all the candidates who qualify. This year there were 12. Many of them were fringe candidates, but five or six were serious candidates. How do you qualify? Um, you get, you get um, sponsors. You have to, you have to get uh, 500 sponsors from across France 
These sponsors come from officials who hold office at the local and regional levels and also members of parliament. So it's an, it's an elite uh, group of um, sponsors. Uh, generally speaking, any politician who's pretty well known has no trouble in getting uh, those 12, uh, those uh, 500 signatures. Um, but some people do fail. If, you're, if you are a fringe candidate, you're going to have trouble. Uh, 12, uh, there were 12 uh, this time, last time, I think it was 16 or 17. So this is crucial. The first ballot determines a lot. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So the second ballot is, is actually the runoff of only the top two. And in this case, as I probably everyone knows, it was Macron against Marine Le Pen. And finally, unlike in the United States, this guarantees that uh, a majority of voters determines the winner. Uh, there's a sharp contrast with the way presidential elections are done in the United States. And I'm not, uh, I'm not going to pursue that comparison here, um, but you should be aware of that. Okay, let's move to slide uh, four. Um, um, to, I want to put this in perspective uh, a little bit of the nature of politics in France, because we have a wide variety of candidates and parties, uh, and this is not new. This is traditionally the case. Um, in, in this year, in, uh, in uh, 2022, uh, we uh, could identify several major strains within across the, the, the spectrum from left to right. Uh, starting with the far left uh, and uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, a well-known figure in France, uh, a hard left figure, not a member of the Communist Party, but a member of originally of the Socialist Party who left the Socialist Party and formed his own, and he has become a force on the left. Uh, then there's the moderate left, which, which usually means the Socialist Party, but it also means the Greens and some other fringe candidates. Um, more on them in a moment. In the center, we have uh, Macron himself, who has occupied the center. Uh, he has dominated the center by winning the last election in 2017. Um, so we can, uh, we can define the center by him and by his movement. On the moderate right, this is the traditional party of government in France. Um, the candidate this time was Valérie Pécresse, who did not do very well. In fact, she did uh, terribly. Um, and we'll say more about her and we'll say more about bo both of those moderate, the moderates from the left and the moderates from the right because they're both in trouble, big trouble. And then we have the far right. Well, we're familiar with some far right candidates in American politics, um, but here we have uh, in, in this election, we had two serious far right candidates running for the presidency. Marine Le Pen, well-known figure, she has run, this is the third time she's run for public office for, for the presidency. Uh, she's done better every time she's won. So she's picked up votes, but uh, she has never gotten to a position where she could win the election. Um, and then there's Mr. Zamor, a relatively unknown figure um, uh, a year or two ago, but a, a pundit, a radio talk show figure, um, a very far right uh, um, uh, character who, who um, appeared to be a major threat to Le Pen herself. And we'll, we'll come back to him in a bit. I should say he is uh, of Jewish origin and Algerian origin. Um, and uh, this colors, I think, his own life experience. And it seems to have affected some of his political thinking. Then, and I won't talk about these people any further, the fringe candidates, a bunch of them, both on the left and the right. Uh, none of them did well enough to be taken too seriously. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, here's the left. Uh, I wanna talk about the left, then the right, then the center. Um, so here we have at least five candidates who are worth mentioning. Um, Ranging from the Communist Party, he's the fellow on the on your on your uh, far left. Uh, yes, your far left, um, Roussel. He he uh, he ended up with about three plus something percent. Not too bad for the communists these days. They used to be a much uh, more serious threat. Um, and then uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who I've already mentioned, 
his party is uh, the unsub uh, uh, France unsubmitting is the, a rough translation of LFI. And then there's Anne Hidalgo, uh, who was mayor of Paris. And you might think that she would have had a good chance uh, to be a serious candidate. Uh, she never got above 10% in popularity in any of the polls. And she ended up with less than 2%, so a disaster. And she was the official candidate of the Socialist Party, another disaster. And then we had a couple of other candidates, most notably the, uh, the Green Party candidate, Jadot, who did reasonably well um, for a minor party candidate. And he now is uh, seeking an alliance uh, into the legislative elections. And I, I wanna talk more about that too. Um, so keep him in mind. So that's what the left looks like. And at, at early on, um, it, would have, it would have been hard to pick a winner. Turned out it was Mélenchon by far. And that is uh, in itself significant. Okay, let's go to slide number, the next slide. Um, here, here's, the other, here's the other side of the moderate picture. The LR, as its uh, abbreviation is, they were publicam. Um, I have to tell you, this is the... Um, this is the inheritor of the Gaullist tradition in France. They no longer call themselves Gaullists, uh, but they are derived from Gaullism. And in fact, the Fifth Republic itself is the product of Gaullism. So we're talking about a Gaullist political system, uh, which was inspired by de Gaulle's own thinking. So uh, the, the LR has changed its name many times, uh, and, and this is the current name. Uh, this time around, the picture on the moderate right looked very much like the picture on the moderate left, a whole bunch of candidates, five or six of them. Now, what they did uh, was to hold a primary. And out of that primary, the primary was only for party members. It was not a, a wide open primary as we're used to in the United States. And Pécresse won that. That's not surprising. She's a well-known politician. Uh, she was president, still is president, of the region of Ile-de-France, which is the single largest region in France because it incorporates all of Paris and all of the surrounding Parisian region. So she had a very strong base. And I must tell you, I thought she would do very well, and I thought she had a chance of coming in second. I was absolutely wrong on that uh, uh, line of thinking. I won't call it a prediction. Um, so, uh, because she ended up with less than 5% of the vote, so a, a terrible disaster. Uh, what her political future is, we don't know. I think she still may have one, um, but uh, she showed poor, really very poorly. Um, and when she, I must say, when she won the primary, I thought she would go on to be a candidate in the 20% range, which would have put her into uh, competition with, the, with all the other serious candidates. Uh, that just did not happen. And it's hard to explain why, because she has a strong base in her own region. She has a strong network of allies within her old party, um, but all of that crumbled as the campaign went on. And so she disappeared uh, as a serious candidate. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's the other, uh, uh, the, the other serious candidate, uh, Marine Le Pen. She's been around for years. Uh, she inherited the uh, Front National, which is the far right uh, nationalistic uh, anti-immigrant party in France, or the pre preeminent one. Um, uh, and uh, she has uh, been a, a very durable candidate. She's a good campaigner. I will say that about her. She's uh, and she's gotten better. And we see that over time, her, her, uh, her, her uh, ability to attract votes has gone up. Every time she's won, she's increased her share, but she still hasn't gotten to the point where she can win on a second ballot. Now, what her future is, we don't know. Um, we shall see. Uh, she, she has said, uh, but I don't really believe her that this will be her, this was her last campaign. Uh, that seems unlikely. Okay, let's go on. Next slide. Okay, here's the here's Eric Zemmour, the the gentleman I mentioned to you. Uh, he has uh, he has distinguished himself uh, by uh, 
developing a lot of the most extreme right-wing fringe ideas that you hear in American politics coming out of many radio talk show uh, figures. Um, uh, uh, he, um, he is the advocate of so-called replacement theory, the idea that uh, white Europeans will be replaced by non-white minorities over time. So fund fundamentally an anti-immigrant um, uh, line of argument. Uh, but he made an impact. And at one point, it looked like he might do better than Marine Le Pen. In fact, he did not. He faded at the end and ended up with only 7%. But he was up about 18% at one point. So something went wrong in his campaign. I think uh, he did not show very well on TV. He did not show very well in the limited debates that were held. Um, and so he, he, uh, he dropped back. Okay, next slide. Okay, let's look at the polls, uh, results and polls. I wanna say uh, two things here. One is uh, go back to 2017. You see the results of the first ballot in the uh, left-hand column that's in red. Uh, here you see the, the Macron won that one. Uh, that's an amazing thing in itself. It's, a, it's nobody thought he could do it. He came from nowhere. He was relatively unknown. Uh, he formed his own party um, and he challenged the, uh, the established figures in, the, in both the uh, 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 the socialists on the left and the and the Gaullists on the right, and he co-opted many of those people and many of their supporters. Um, but he did win. You can see also it was very close. This was a very contested uh, race for the first ballot in 2017, but it was crucial. Le Pen came in second. Pécresse, Pécresse was not the candidate. I, her name is there because she's the candidate in this this time. Fion, Francois Fillon, you'll see his name in parentheses, was the candidate, um, but got involved in a major scandal known as Penelope Gate, named after his wife, in which uh, uh, she had been hired for a fake job in the uh, parliamentary staff, and uh, Fion's children were also hired for fake jobs. Uh, this, was a, uh, this was a disastrous scandal, but, but Fion did, did well, he got 20%. Had the scandals not been there, he could have won. And we might be talking about a Fion presidency rather than a Macron presidency. Uh, so it's a very tight race. The other thing to note back then is that Mélenchon then was also very strong, you see. He came in fourth, but he's only one or two percentage points behind uh, Fion and Le Pen. Uh, compare that to the first ballot uh, this time around, which is the right-hand column, also in red, you can see that it's uh, not uh, very different from five years ago, except that Macron was a little stronger, Le Pen was a little stronger, uh, Pécresse was a disaster, Zamor was a disaster, um, <clears throat> and Mélenchon was very strong, but came in third. So you come in third and you're out. Um, the, the poll figures, I, I gave you the, full, uh, the poll figures that we have for, uh, running from February through April, just to give you a sense of the trends of popular support. You see Macron went up in March. This certainly appears to have been a function of his uh, involvement in international diplomacy. This, was, this is just at the time as the, um, <clears throat> the Russian aggression against Ukraine takes place. And Macron became the leading European uh, um, a spokesperson for dealing with uh, Putin. And um, he, he went to Russia at least once. He was on the phone with him many times. Uh, so um, this gave him a boost. In fact, one poll had him over 33%. But that faded. To, as we got to election day, that faded. And he came down to 28 27%. But he still won. He still came in first. That's a pretty good showing in the French context. In the American context, that wouldn't look so good. Um, but in the French context, it does. But, but you can see that over the, this time period, it has been extremely competitive. Uh, we, have no, we, we don't see anyone who has broken out on the first ballot to be way ahead of anyone else. And therefore, the race on the second ballot um, 
uh, would be, um, should be, or should have been uh, very close. Uh, it, it was not so close this time. That's partly because Le Pen won, she came in second, um, and therefore it was a runoff between Macron and Le Pen. And so we have almost a repeat of the election of um, five years earlier. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, here's the results of the first ballot, just so you know what they are. Um, 27.6 to 23.0 to 22.2. Again, really very, very competitive. But the, the big news is that Macron won and uh, Le Pen won. And Jean-Luc Jean Mélenchon was out, but not out by that much. And so it could have been very different. Okay, next slide. Uh, here, here's Mélenchon uh, um, uh, in a victorious mood. He, 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 maybe he shouldn't have been, he didn't, he didn't win, but he did extremely well. Nobody thought he would do that well, getting 22%. He was figured in the, most of the polls down around 15. Um, so he had a long, he had a surge um, and did it seem extremely well, but not well enough. So uh, next, uh, next slide. Okay, let's talk about Putin a little bit, because uh, obviously the Russian war, or the Ukrainian war, and the Russian aggression played a, a, a major um, role in the impact on European politics, and especially in France, because it's France that was having the election uh, of all the major, there were some other elections going on in, in Europe, but France was the major country having an election. The German election held last year uh, would have been impacted by this, but of course at that time there was no sign of a Russian attack against Ukraine. Uh, so here we have uh, a picture of Macron uh, visiting, visiting Putin, um, and the question was, would diplomacy, at least one question was, as far as French politics goes, uh, would, would his diplomacy really help his campaign? It appeared at first that it did. Uh, the polls did show him getting a boost, but it was not a strong boost. And, uh, and of course, uh, his negotiations, uh, although well-intended, did not produce any major results. So um, it's, not, it's not clear that the... Um, the Russian factor played into the, the minds of French voters that much. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this I had to put this picture in because I think it's a classic, um, mainly because of the table, not because the two men were there. Uh, this is this is weird. This is weird diplomacy. Um, there they are. Uh, they must have translators somewhere, but they're not to be seen. Uh, but there they are sitting at this enormous 20-foot table at, at the two ends. Uh, we see this picture uh, in other contexts um, with other leaders going to Moscow. Um, but uh, this, this, was, uh, this was Macron's uh, most serious attempt to have a, have a sit-down. He did have one with Putin, but he, didn't, uh, he wasn't able to convince Putin of anything. And that's really not surprising. But again, from our point of view, studying the election, it's interesting to ask um, whether whether this um, had an impact. It may have it may have boosted Macron's uh, general image um, and may have helped him defend against uh, Le Pen. Also, it showed that he was taking a, a stance that was contrary to Le Pen. We might mention that Le Pen uh, has borrowed millions and millions of euros from from Europe uh, in support of her campaign, uh, that, that uh, Putin has been one of her main bankers. Uh, and he used this very effectively in the TV debate just before the second ballot. Uh, so it, it, it did figure into, into the election. Um, but of course, that it didn't end the war. That's the most important thing to say. Okay, let's move, go on to past uh, Putin. All right, the, the second ballot results are, to my mind, uh, really quite uh, impressive. Um, uh, if this were an American election, this would be, this would be characterized as a major landslide, 58.5% against 41.5. Um, the French don't see it quite the same way that Americans would see it. Um, they're not so impressed by those numbers. 
um, because uh, they, they do they say and they're right that uh, there was an awful lot of really negative voting. Uh, a lot of people who were voting for Le Pen because they disliked Macron intensely, and uh, on the other side, and even more strongly, a lot of people who disliked Le Pen hated her even and who were voting for Macron instead. So the vote was not, uh, was, was not such a positive endorsement for either one that they were capturing votes of, of people who were uh, alienated, but in very different ways. Uh, even so, it's a decisive election uh, and it's a strong result for Macron, Macron as we move into the next stage, uh, which is what we'll come to in a little bit. That is the legislative elections that are coming up. Okay, next slide. All right, I want to talk a little about, about uh, geography here. Um, it's always interesting to look at France uh, from a geographic point of view. Uh, I, I'm not going to show you a whole lot of maps here because we don't have time. Um, but uh, there is, there, there is a, a fundamental dividing line, which is essentially geographic in nature. Um, if you look at Le Pen's support, it is very heavily a Parisian support. Uh, Le Pen, uh, sorry, Macron won Paris by 85%. Now that's unbelievable, but it's true. Um, uh, Le Pen herself uh, did very poorly in Paris. Uh, she had no strong base there. Um, Mélenchon did in certain parts of Paris, but Le Pen did not. And her support really comes from the opposite. It, it comes from the, uh, the uh, deindustrialized belt of France, especially in the Northeast, the old coal mining country. This is where she's running very, very strongly these days in small town France and what is often referred to as forgotten France. Uh, she also has her traditional base in the South and that has gotten stronger too. And she has moved into other parts of uh, France geographically where she was not so strong. But, the, but the, there's a basic division between the urban nature of Macron's support. He won all the big cities. There's no exception there. All the big cities. Um, Le Pen uh, won in, in smaller towns and in rural areas and in deindustrialized France. Um, mixed with this, is the anger against Macron that uh, prompted the uh, famous uh, Gilets Jaunes protests uh, back uh, four or five years ago when he was first president uh, because of his raising of taxes on fuel and uh, diesel fuel. Um, and uh, one has to remember that uh, the, the people most affected by that, well, the Gilets Jaunes were people who, who lived uh, far away from where they worked. They had to get to work very often by driving. Uh, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't easily do it by train. Um, and they were suffering from closures, and the closures of factories, but also closures of things like hospitals uh, and, um, and, other, and other facilities. So the tremendous discontent uh, in the countryside in France and I, I, I wonder whether we will see a, um, a return of that kind of discontent once uh, Macron gets into his second term. Um, okay, let's move on. I think we have a map coming up here. Next slide, here we go. Uh, this shows you a little bit of the geography of uh, which I was just talking about. Uh, the purple areas are, the re, uh, are departments uh, that France is divided into part departments, uh, about 106 of them. Um, so they're nice little units you can look at to analyze elections. You, you see uh, Paris is that white dot in the middle, and then it has, it's been extrapolated out into the larger um, uh, figure on the, upper, on the upper left hand side. You can see it's all, it's all Macron. You can see Macron won almost everywhere. Uh, but where Le Pen won, it's exactly where I told you, it's in the deindustrialized rust belt of France, the poorer regions of France, places where um, you see factories closing, you see, you see people out of work, you see out migration, and you see tremendous resentment against uh, foreigners and immigrants. Now, down in the south of France, 
uh, along the Côte d'Azur, also on other Mediterranean down, down by the Spanish border, you see bastions of support for Le Pen. These are her traditional bastions. Even her father ran well there um, because the, this is where you have a very heavy uh, ex-Algerian population. Um, and that is also indicative of the support that, that Zamor uh, was based on. The little dots, uh, this is the last thing I'll say about this for now because one can get bogged down in these maps. Uh, the little uh, blue, dark blue uh, dots to, on the left-hand side, these are overseas territories, overseas departments of France like Martinique and Guadeloupe and, uh, and others. And, you, and it's surprising that Le Pen was able to win all of these. She didn't do so before. Uh, Mélenchon ran very strongly there on the first ballot and Le Pen picked up a lot of that Mélenchon support on the second ballot. The other uh, one piece of curiosity is Corsica, which is down, down uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the right of your map, um, which um, Le Pen won uh, overwhelmingly, which I don't think she had done before. So you see an interesting geographical pattern. Uh, it gets even more interesting if we break it down into smaller units, but we're not going to do that right now. So I'll also mention that the, the, the breadth of uh, Macron's support is indicated here because he did win 73 departments. Um, um, and that is, a, that is a pretty impressive score. Uh, and and he, he won the entire, really the entire Western and Southern portions of France, except for the Mediterranean region. Okay, let's go on to our next uh, slide. Well, this simply summarizes, here's Macron on uh, election night with his wife. Uh, this is uh, out uh, on the uh, Champ de Mar, um, a, a good rallying point and the weather was pretty good. Um, and with the uh, Eiffel Tower in the background, you can't see it there, but it is there. Um, and, and this summarizes briefly the results of the second ballot. A fragmentation of the party system into three blocks. Um, so this is a, a transformation of the party system is, is a very, very significant thing that's happened in this election. Uh, three blocks being Macron in the middle with the biggest block and the two extremist parties uh, the, the far left of Mélenchon and, the, and, uh, and Le Pen's uh, uh, national rally on the far right. So, and the collapse of the traditional parties that I mentioned before, which I think is a, a very telling uh, uh, consequence of this election. Uh, so let's move on before I pass this one. Now, um, this is worth mentioning just because uh, I won't go into all the uh, verbiage here, but um, uh, Marine Le Pen did concede. Uh, there's no question about, there was no question uh, raised about uh, um, um, fake elections or rigged elections or anything of that sort. Le Pen acknowledged that she lost uh, and uh, no, nobody questioned that at all. Um, um, but the, uh, her national rally did, it, did the best it has ever done. Again, it shows that the extremes are getting stronger in France on both sides, both far left, far right. Um, and uh, e even though uh, she was disappointed, uh, still it's, it's uh, from her point of view and the point of view her her party, it's, it's, uh, it's not all bad news. Let's go on to the next one. Here's her, here's her the supporters on election night, uh, again, enjoying the strongest ever uh, showing that she's had, and she certainly widened her appeal. Uh, she also changed her emphasis. She moved away from her traditional anti-immigration stances to some degree and talked about really bread and butter type issues. Inflation is hitting France just like it's hitting the United States. Uh, people are... Um, it's not that the unemployment rate is going up. Actually, it's going down in France. It's, uh, it's much better than it was. Um, but there's certainly plenty of discontent. And that is captured in, in her, by her movement. OK, next slide. Well, here's, a, here's, uh, here's forgotten France for you. There, you could see 
Um, if you traveled around France outside of Paris, outside of the big cities, you'd see towns like this, which seem quite desolate, uh, where jobs have gone and where people seem to have gone too. I thought it would be interesting just to show you one of those pictures. Um, I don't, we, uh, not going to show you any others at this point. Okay, next. Okay, victory night. Here we are right in front of the uh, Arc de Triomphe. And uh, here you see the rally for Macron, 58.2. Actually, that's a little low. It went up to 58.5. Um, um, uh, and and uh, this was a moment of uh, um, uh, obvious, uh, obvious joy for Macron. Okay, next, please. Um, yeah, a historic win. Yes, it is. Uh, but uh, the downside is that Macron has effectively polarized France. This is the opinion of uh, one of the leading writers at the BBC. Um, uh, he, he has uh, he has done what other uh, what uh, what other of his predecessors could not do. Um, we do know that Francois Mitterrand got reelected in in 1988, and Jacques Chirac got reelected in 2002. But uh, after that, nobody could get reelected um, uh, until Macron. So he's broken through and and won that second term. Um, uh, so uh, uh, he's he's in position to have a strong impact as as a as a reelected president. He has a, a potential for a strong impact, and he is uh, he is an activist president. He, uh, he is not going to sit back, and of course he's got a lot of challenges facing him. So uh, there's more much more to say about that as we get into his second term. All right, let's see what we have next. Next slide. Um, yeah, let's skip over this one. This repeats a little bit of what we just said. Uh, okay, here's one I wanted to show you. Um, this is um, when we're talking about the collapse of the traditional parties. Here it is. And, and there's 20, 2017, you see the vote for uh, Francois Fillon, the candidate of the LR, pretty strong with a um, with a number of areas where uh, pretty in the dark blue where, where his party and his candidacy came in first. Um, the big blue blob in the um, upper um, uh, Western portion of France, of course, this is his home, his home region. This is where he lives. This is where he's best known, but he's, he did well elsewhere. He didn't do well enough, of course. Now you look at 2022, uh, Valérie Pécresse did well almost nowhere. Um, she was leading in, these are communes, these are not departments. Um, uh, Fionn, you see one, uh, was leading in uh, over 5,000 uh, communes, Pécresse only in 37. That's uh, kind of pathetic. Um, and that's, that's, an, that's certainly a good indication of the, the disaster that befell this party. Okay, next please. So just to summarize this point, and I think it's an important point, um, she, um, Pecrest that is, um, suffered a, 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 a horrible defeat. Uh, it was the big, one of the big surprises of the whole evening. Um, yes, it, uh, people knew she was not going to do well, but nobody thought she'd do this badly. Um, a lot of people thought she'd be around 10%, but she's below 5%. And by the way, when a candidate goes below 5%, they get no reimbursement for campaign expenses. In France, a candidate gets reimbursed, um, unlike in the United States. But, uh, 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 but you have to win 5%, and she did not. This is a financial disaster for her party, by the way. They're in, they're in big trouble money-wise. And the socialists, same story, even worse. Here's uh, Anne Hidalgo, mayor of Paris. You might thought might have thought she would do much better than she did. She was completely wiped out, uh, even in Paris. Um, ended up with less than two percent of the vote, and and much less than her predecessor. Her predecessor five years ago, Hamon, uh, did very poorly, six point three. 
But she did worse than that, much worse. Nobody, nobody thought that was gonna happen, but it did. Okay, next slide. Okay, let's turn to consequences because uh, because I wanna leave time for questions. I'm sure you'll have a few. Um, next slide, please. Okay, on the European front, this is a very big uh, set of issues here. Remember that Angela Merkel is no longer chancellor. Uh, she was the leading, uh, for de facto, the leading figure in Europe, the leader of the strongest and biggest country uh, in the European Union, um, but she's gone. Macron is now in a position to uh, 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 take over this role as fa faction, de facto leader of the European Union. That, that carries with it uh, only symbolic value but nevertheless, he will be in a position to speak for Europe more than anyone else. Uh, and for the time being, uh, he is in a much stronger position than his German uh, counterpart, who was also just reelected or reelected for the first time. Um, um, and certainly, uh, we have to say that Macron is a, is a convinced European. He, he believes in Europe. He, he, uh, in, in the sense that all the, the, the leading figures of Europe, including Merkel, have, have done in, over the last 30 or 40 years uh, in an attempt to build the European pillar. It's something he does want to do. He will be working on that. Um, but he's also going to be playing a leading role uh, on the European side in terms of how the European Union operates and uh, the, uh, the support that Europe gives to NATO. Uh, and of course, this is more and more important given the outbreak of war uh, in, in uh, Ukraine. Um, one, one last point here, uh, Macron's win is a, a blow to Viktor Orban, the, uh, the populistic, nationalistic, uh, anti-democratic leader of Hungary, who did win his own election a couple of weeks ago. So he'll, he'll still be in office. He'll, he will be a thorn in the side of the other Europeans um, and he's not going away. So that's a one, one problem that Macron will be concerned about. Next slide. Uh, okay, the, the, this is uh, important. Uh, the, the German, uh, the Franco-German relationship has, been, has always been central to European integration uh, and it still is. Um, but here we have two new leaders. So we have, there's a big question mark about how strong that relationship will be uh, with, with Merkel as chancellor. Um, it was pretty strong and her relationship to the French presidents uh, that she dealt with was pretty good with the exception of uh, Hollande who she didn't really get along with very well. Uh, but um, uh, she built a strong uh, relationship to France. Uh, this this time around, we, we want to see how these two leaders uh, will work together. And of course, their working together um, uh, is will be tested in the uh, in dealing with the Ukrainian crisis. So that's something that we want to look forward to or to see how it develops. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, on the domestic side of consequences, uh, I mentioned this also, but I want to re-mention it. Um, France has become more radicalized by this election, as as we as we noted earlier, the the extremes are stronger. Um, Le Pen is uh, has been uh, building her support on uh, voter disappointment and dis and uh, and discontent, and she will continue to do that. Mélenchon is doing similar things on the other side, on the far left. Um, where, by the way, he is put, trying to put together a coalition of the left in anticipation of the upcoming legislative elections. And finally, on the domestic side, there are a lot of other things we could say here, but well, there's one very big issue that's will, that will return, and that is pension reform. Pension reform is a hot issue in Europe, and especially in France. Uh, Macron realizes that the pension system in France has to be reformed, um, uh, currently, there are about 42 different pension uh, systems uh, for different types of workers. He wants to nationalize that and develop a national pension system, um, but he also wants to increase the uh, age of retirement to 
65. This is something that a lot of people are very unhappy with. A lot of people retire at 60 because uh, they have worked 40 years. And if they started off at say uh, 20, then they're, they're ready to retire at 60. And in some job categories, it could be earlier than that. But the system cannot handle it. It's a, it's a pay as you go system. Um, and everybody knows that it's going to go bankrupt because the country is getting older. There are more people who are retiring. There's less money that will be coming into the pension system unless it is reformed and unless the age of uh, retirement is, is uh, increased. That is a, a explosive issue. That was also part of the kind of protest movement that we saw with the uh, Gilets Jaunes. So if that's, a, that's a story that we want to look at as Macron starts his second term, because he will come back to this. He put it off because he knew he had the election. He didn't want that to be the election issue because it's a bad one for him. Um, he put it off, but he wants to come back to it. Okay, so let's see, next, next slide. Uh, this just carries on with this. Here we have some worker protests against Macron. Um, he, has, he has brought about a lot of economic reform some of it uh, not so popular, but he has created jobs. He has built uh, support, um, has built, uh, he has spent a lot of money on supporting workers and businesses through, throughout the COVID period. And he subsidized uh, both gas and petrol prices. So uh, he's done a lot of things, but he doesn't get a lot of uh, rewards for that in terms of popularity. Next, please. Okay. I mentioned the Gilets Jaunes. I didn't want to leave them out. Uh, this is four years ago. This is back in 2018. If you had been in Paris at that time, you might have been caught in one of these demonstrations, and they're not a lot of fun to be caught in. Uh, they were all over France. This, this picture is in Paris, and here we see the police confronting the Gilets Jaunes. Um, if discontent explodes again, we'll, I will see something like this. And uh, this will be another challenge for, for Macron. Uh, that is, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not predicting it'll be exactly the same thing, but there's a high, a high potential for it. Okay, next slide. Okay, the legislative elections. Um, this is the, the here's the, uh, the unknown. Um, we know what happened in the presidential elections. We have Macron reelected, uh, that's fine. Uh, but we also have uh, a, another set of elections in June. Remember that France is a, is a hybrid presidential parliamentary system. Um, this is something for that Americans would have trouble understanding. Doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. And indeed, there are a lot of Europeans who don't understand it either. But the fact is that uh, the French president governs uh, as long as he can uh, maintain his majority in the French parliament. And that will have to be done in the June elections. Um, whether, whether he can control, uh, he has going, uh, going out, uh, he has a majority of about 313 seats out of 577. Can he hold on to those 313 seats? This is a very big question mark. Most experts that I've read recently seem to think he has a good chance of doing it, but he's probably going to lose seats. Um, this is a different, this is a two ballot election system. So you might think it's like the presidential one, but it's very different because it's a two ballot election system in 577 different constituencies. So a lot of things can happen. A lot of bargains are being made between the parties to support each other or not to compete against each other in certain districts. How far those alliances go will have a lot to say about uh, how, how uh, great the threat to Macron's majority is. Okay, next slide. Uh, this follows up on this. Um, the, um, the, um, the Macron party, which is the LREM, um, it has a number of outgoing uh, seats uh, of the, it had 313, as I mentioned, it's, it's got uh, 267 who will run again, 
um, plus 57 from Modem, uh, an allied party, and 22 from Agir, another allied party. Um, how many of these can be uh, held on to is a very big question mark. Um, but um, back uh, five years ago, nobody really thought he could, he could win a majority in parliament, but he did. Um, and so uh, maybe he can do it again. This, this will be a big test. These elections are coming up in June. Uh, they're held on the 12th and 19th of June, first ballot, second ballot. Uh, and so this is something we'll want to be watching. Uh, next, please. Okay, here's just to give you an idea of what the, the French uh, parliament, this is the National Assembly, looks like. Well, the purple is, is uh, Macron's party, the LREM. Uh, the yellow is the Republicans, uh, Pécresse's party, which was... Uh, took a disastrous defeat in the presidential election, will, will they take another disastrous uh, beating this time around? And then you have the Greens, and you have the far left, the LFI, you have the FN, the Browns, that is uh, Le Pen's vote, only seven seats there, and then fringe candidates. Um, whether the quest question mark is, will, will an alliance of the left enhance that red piece of the pie, and will Le Pen be able to gain seats uh, based on general discontent? Uh, the green um, portion is for greens, of course. Um, but one of the biggest questions is whether that yellow block can hold its own. Um, it has, uh, that's 121 seats right now, um, and we don't know. Will they make deals? We don't know that either. Deals are being made right now as we sit here talking about this on the left. So the parties of the left are trying to make deals uh, to secure seats for themselves. Uh, whether the LR party will be willing to do the same, they have said they don't want to do that, but maybe they will come to their senses and have to do it. And they'll have to do it in, in conjunction with Macron's party. So this is part of the dynamics of uh, the two ballot system at the parliamentary level. All right. Um, let's see what our next slide is. Okay, final thoughts. And then we'll, uh, because we're out of time. Um, Macron has been criticized in the past um, by being a very top-down, very personalized, um, seeming to be a very uh, insensitive to the interests of others. He's been, he's been uh, called a Bonapartist, which is really not uh, fair. Uh, but um, he does share some of the rather strong personality traits of a Bonapartist. Uh, um, and uh, <clears throat> the question as we go into this second term is whether we will see more of that, will that intensify, or will he try to modify that and reduce it and not be subject to criticisms along these lines? Um, uh, next slide. Okay, here's Napoleon um, uh, Bonaparte, uh, the first, that's the first Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, uh, and it's interesting that uh, French, when French people are asked, who, who do they think their greatest leaders have been? The two names that are, always, that are always given, that always win these contests are Napoleon, that is Napoleon the first, the one who led to France's great defeat uh, when he tried to conquer Europe, um, but he did do a tremendous number of other things within France. He modernized France. He modernized the administration system. Um, he created a French legal code. He created the prefectural system. He created the lycée system at high school level and the Légion d'honneur. So he did a lot. How, to, how he had time for all that, I, I certainly don't know. Um, but uh, so there's a, there's a, poetic, this is really a poetic type question of whether Macron is a new Napoleon, many of his opponents would say uh, he is. Uh, but more importantly, and this is our final slide, I believe, if you go to the next one. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Um, keep in mind um, that the Fifth Republic is the creation of Charles de Gaulle. He was the first, he was a national hero uh, in the war, uh, and he was the first uh, um, president of the, he was the founder of the Fifth Republic. He, the Constitution of the Fifth Republic embodies his ideas. 
he didn't write it, but one of his lieutenants did. Um, so, um, and he created a very strong president. Uh, this was this was uh, one of the primary things that de Gaulle intended to do when he came back to power in 1958. Um, this was in the context of the Algerian War. Uh, and uh, he insisted on having the power to write a new constitution. That power was given to him. And so we have a constitution which allows for a very strong president. Question is, will Macron become a Gaullist type president? Uh, maybe not a Bonapartist, but perhaps a Gaullist. And that's the concept the French like of the Republican monarch. So that, that's my, that thought I will leave to you. And I'd like to close on a Gaullist note with those two pictures. So let me, let me turn it back to you, Suzanne, and uh, open it up for questions. Excellent. Professor Chandler, this has been a fabulous presentation. You have quite a number of Francophiles uh, uh, lovers, France lovers on the call. So we will have uh, open it up to questions. I'm going to throw one out first. Back to the presidential election. How much has support for the center left disintegration of support for the center left and center right parties um, come from the fear of Le Pen and, and that movement to uh, Macron just to make sure that Le Pen didn't win. Where was there um, polling or you know exit polling to determine what motivated that movement from these other parties to Macron? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yes, there, there has been polling on this. And the polling, uh, both before the election and after the election, at least what we've seen so far, sure we'll get some more polls, uh, shows that a lot of people re were voting for Macron out of fear, and that meant that meant people who would have traditionally voted for their old favorite party, the Socialists or the Republicans, um, were uh, incentivized, you might say to vote for Macron as a protection against Le Pen in particular, and as a protect, protection against Mélenchon, who has turned out to be a, um, a serious contender as well, as one of the one we didn't really expect. But yes, that definitely is the case. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Steven Adler. I thank you, Suzanne. Hey, Bill, great to see you. Thank you for this. This was terrific. Um, how how did uh, the vote fall out relative to um, religious uh, demographics? Uh, Islamic uh, voters, was there a trend or was that more dependent upon ge geography? And also, for example, although they're a small minority, Jewish voters, um, how did they view uh, Macron's uh, uh, stance on the rising tide of both anti-immigrant, how do the different groups view Macron's stance on the rising tide of anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and also anti-Semitic acts? Yes. How did that all play in? Yeah, uh, well, first on the Muslims, uh, France has the largest Muslim population in Europe. Uh, I think the numbers are about 7 million. Uh, I'm not sure the exact number, uh, but, but these are citizens. These are French citizens. Uh, most of them, not all, but most of them are citizens and they're voters. How did they vote? Well, they, it's not surprising they voted for the left on the first ballot. That's, that's very clear. All the polls show that. Um, but uh, that meant voting for um, uh, uh, Mélenchon in particular, and for, perhaps for some of the other fringe uh, left candidates, the Communist Party candidate. Um, but the, on the second ballot, they had to take their second choice. And it's pretty clear that they were not going to vote for Le Pen. Now, many of those Muslims may have just desisted, not voted at all. Um, but uh, of those who did vote, certainly um, they voted more for Macron. So this was a, this was a benefit to Macron. Um, the, well, the Jewish vote is not very big. Um, uh, the, the one of the curious and, and one would expect that Jews generally will vote for the left or the center left for the most part. And uh, I, I haven't seen a, uh, any poll that breaks it down that uh, finely, but uh, 
certainly uh, they were not going to vote for Le Pen. Uh, they were, uh, then they certainly, well, the, one of the curious things is that Zamor is a Jew. Would, would Jews vote for an extremist Jew? That, that uh, now we don't, I don't think we have any data on that just yet, but we will probably get some. Um, but his vote was not that big. Remember, he only got 7%. So I suspect not very much, not very much from that source. Oh, I like your Nick shirt there. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Question from Peter Gurevich. Peter? Hi, Bill. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the detailed uh, remarks and comments. It was uh, fun to have all that. I wonder whether you think, given how well Mélenchon did, I mean, he came very close to knocking out Le Pen. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, Macron now has to face a choice? Does he tack left to pick up all those Mélenchon people, or does he tack to the right to pick up the, uh, the unhappy Le Pens? Because the Le Pens are in, many of them are in working class districts. These are two alternatives for working class people. Yes. Which, which way, if you were, uh, Macron's advisor, what would you tell him to do? Which tack would you take? Well, I, th I think he should go after the Mélenchon voters. Uh, I mean, if, that, if, if I were to be an advisor, which I'm not, but, but if I were, I would think he would want to go that way. But how would he do it? And I mean, what would be the appeal? If he goes that way, what's the Well, uh, but first of all, he's got to soften his approach on the pension question. This is, this is one that, which is gonna cause him a lot of trouble. Um, now, the good news is he's won the election already. And so he's got a certain freedom, but if he wants to um, not alienate the, this electorate out there on the far left, uh, he's going to have to tread carefully. Mm -hmm. now, the test of that is coming right away in the legislative elections. So it's, uh, it's um, after June, we'll know uh, what happened, we'll, and we'll, um, uh, we'll see whether his strategy uh, really succeeds. No, but I'm saying he has to make the decision now as part of his appeal yes. for the legislative elections. It's not policy afterwards, it's on the way in. Yes, I agree. Well, I, I, would, think, um, uh, I would think he would want to not talk about pensions, frankly, until, that, until the legislative elections are over. Um, but he knows he's got a problem there on the left, and, and it's been accentuated by all the uh, maneuvering that has been going on in the past uh, uh, week or so since, since the uh, last results came in. Uh, the parties of the left have been negotiating, and they are building uh, uh, alli electoral alliances for the legislative elections. How strong those will be and how, whether, they, whether they will hold, I'm not sure. Uh, the Greens have already signed an agreement with Mélenchon. Um, the Socialists are, as, as I understand it, and this is just based on newspaper articles, are, are very ambivalent and they're fearful of doing that because they're fearful of getting sucked into becoming part of the Mélenchon uh, machinery. Um, and then other, other fringe left groups uh, the communists, I believe, have signed on in some form, but will their voters follow them? That we don't know. That's a that's a very big question there. But I think he has to. I think he has to tilt that way for the time being to minimize the danger. Because the danger is, what if he doesn't get a majority in the in the legislative right. elections? Then we're back to the old cohabitation. Right. The French hate. Uh, co cohabitation is, is divided government. In America, we're used to divided government. Uh, actually, it doesn't work that well here anymore. We hate but, it here too, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, I, I would think that's the way he would go. Thanks. Bill, in a recent presentation by Barbara Walter, she talked about to the people who were supporting Trump, et cetera, is sort of the sons of the soil. It sounds like there is a direct relationship to the Le Pen supporters. Um, do you see that? Yes, I think so. Yes, uh, I do. I think there's a lot of, a lot of uh, parallels there. Uh, clearly, um, um, uh, Trump Trump's, uh, has seen Le Pen as, as one of his uh, 
and one of his potential allies around the world, along with Putin, of course. Putin's the most important one, isn't he? Um, and Le Pen has been connected to, to Putin, too, uh, partly through the, all the money that, that he's provided for her. But there's, a, there's clearly a, a, common, uh, a common trend towards the authoritarian right uh, that all of these leaders seem to share. And of course, Viktor Orban, the man I just mentioned briefly, he's, he's uh, one of the most outspoken. Um, so we're, I think we are seeing that. And I, and I think we're seeing that the, uh, uh, the right wing in America is, is, is based on the same kinds of uh, social classes that uh, Marine Le Pen's support is um, in, in peripheral, peripheral America, you know, Rust Belt America. Uh, let's say West Virginia, uh, French style. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that there's a um, that that there's a, a common there's, there's some common bonds there. How strong? Hard to say. But and of course, every election is fought differently in every country. Right. Question from Stephen Adler. Stephen. Ah yes, I can't I can't stop myself. Um, Bill, uh, maybe this is too large a question and you can, you can swat it away if it is, um, but with Le Pen's jump uh, from last time to this time, mm -hmm. with Orban, uh, with Schultz being, I guess, more right center than, than um, uh, Merkel was, um, do you, what do you see as, do you see France as being sort of this floating island in the middle of a dissolving EU or what do you, what do you see as the, the future for the European map in that political, geopolitical map in that regard? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. That's all right. I, I, I won't swat it away. Um, uh, I think, um, I, well, I, I put, let me put it this way. I think Macron's victory is a victory for uh, European integration, because he is a believer and and he's a doer as well. Um, just imagine uh, the, what what this would uh, have looked like from at the European level if Le Pen had won. It would be a total disaster, and Europe would be in uproar right right across the continent, uh, all the way to Russia. Um, so. Um, Macron has has in a way for the for the moment I think saved Europe and sa saved the European project. Um, he he does believe in it, and uh, uh, and there of course there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, important tests coming. We we now have as a result of uh, um, a, a result of the war, um, we have a number of countries who would really like to join, um, and they would like to join quickly. That's probably not going to happen. It's almost impossible for a, a membership to be uh, accelerated in that way. Um, and some of the cases that want to, who would like to join, are weak, are weak candidates anyway, on other grounds. But still, there's there's a pressure to expand. Um, uh, uh, this question also goes to NATO, the the, uh, the the relative cohesion strength of NATO, and the question of whether Sweden and Finland will join. Um, uh, that that will also be a difficult one. It will take a long time, if uh, if at all. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment on Steve's question. I think it's a it's a great uh, question. I, I think that Macron and the French have a really contradictory bunch of problems because they uh, yes, you're completely right that. The French victory is an enormous uh, victory. Macron's victory is an enormous gain for all the Europeanists in Europe, in contrast to Le Pen. I, I was going to ask Bill, I'm shocked that the French were not more negative towards, uh, towards Le Pen's su support from Moscow. In a way, that's, that to me suggests the weakness of many people's support of the mm -hmm. EU, and, and it's kind of shocking said so many farmers in particular benefit from the subsidies yes. that the EU gives. So, you know, talk about not knowing what your, how your bread is buttered. It's like mm -hmm. American small states who benefit enormously. The blue states are taxed to support the red states, but we won't go there. But <laughs> I, think that, I think that the French have a real contradiction because they, 
want the EU, but they pursue a rather nationalist game in the EU and, uh, and they have that reputation. And so they're going to have to be play a delicate game and yeah. Macron is going to have to play a delicate game because he has the reputation of wanting the EU to do things which are favored, you know, French industries. He has a, the French have a, their state policy favors national champions. Mm. And, and he has to shift towards European national champions rather than French national champions. Yeah. And that's a real challenge for the French elite civil service, which isn't used to doing that. So yeah. they're going to have a lot of, a lot of uh, tiptoe dancing to do and shifting their rhetoric, their policy and stuff like that. It's going to be an interesting game to watch, right? Yes. No, I would agree with you there. It's a, it's a, it's a very uh, delicate situation. Mm -hmm. Um, And and France has always been in this position of, of uh, pursuing French national interests versus pursuing, pursuing European goals. Right. That, that, that's that that's something that has never gone away. It, it has its bad away. moments and its good moments, but it's always there. Right. And it's very unlike the Germans, uh, who have been right. much more deeply committed to Europe. Um, yes, but there I are think a lot of good reasons for that. Yes, but, but the Germans the Germans are enormous beneficiaries and they hide it. Yes, I they think, are. I think of the German case that came out in the Greek thing where they were. They were enormous beneficiaries of the strong of the strong euro. Yeah, and they hid that fact by refusing by behaving. Oh, we can't subsidize Greece. Well, but it's they who benefited from the strong euro, which they didn't want to weaken. No, I know. Yeah. That's right. Uh, the, so well, the, the, Ger- the German national interest behind the collective interest is just as powerful as the French. So, yeah. yeah. No, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, and, and I think you're right to point to uh, agriculture as, as a key part of this. The subsidy, the, the, On uh, both sides. Cap, yeah. The cap uh, subsidies are enormous. And enormous. Uh, this, is the one, this is the one thing that keeps uh, uh, Hungary in. Right. Uh, right. Because they are getting, uh, East European countries generally, because they're very agricultural, right. are, are enormous beneficiaries of cap. Right. Um, right. And France used to, in the old days, it was really France who been, and the Italians right. maybe who benefited from from cap. But but now right. it's East, Eastern Europe even more. And, right. and so Orban can be uh, uh, pro fascist in his uh, political operation in Hungary, but he doesn't want to leave the EU. and He doesn't want to lose that money. Absolutely. And the same for Poland. Same for Poland. Yeah. So they've all got. <laughs> is it not fascinating as we read about Ukraine and southern Russia that they are fundamental still after 150 years? They are fundamental to the world's world supply yeah. of fundamental grains. Yes, they are still the biggest exporter <laughs> of all those basic grains that the That's world right. depends on. That's right. Well, the great uh, breadbasket of Europe. The great bag basket of Europe. Yeah, of the world, in fact. Of the world, the world. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in the past it was of, of Europe, but now it's... It was the world. Once yeah. they entered the world markets in the late 19th century, That's they right. were supplying the world. Yeah, exactly. Bill, could I bring it back to the party for a moment? Sure. Um, Macron's party was new his last time around, as you yeah. said... This is the last time he can run. Um, Here in the United States, once we elect a president, we're already starting to think who's the next person that we're going to be able to to launch. Are there some rising stars in Macron's center party or or Uh, not? Can you point it? That's a very interesting question. Uh, There will be, uh, clearly there will be jockeying going on to... uh, among various politicians to establish themselves as the successor. Um, uh, Edouard Philippe is talked about a lot. Uh, he's, he was former prime minister for uh, Macron, um, but he's formed his own party and I, I, I'm not sure, um, but he may be a little bit of, out of favor with Macron because he did that. Um, but he's, he's well known because he served as prime minister. He's popular too. Uh, he's now the mayor of La Havre, up in up in northern, uh, on the coast, um, but he is he certainly has apparent ambition. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see who uh, who and how many 
people and in, uh, leading figures that Macron feels he has to integrate into his movement. That depends on how well he does in the legislative elections. But there's a lot of politicians out there in the LR, um, and Pécresse may be one of them, uh, who might be recruited to take cabinet positions or to uh, basically uh, blend into the larger uh, macro, uh, macro movement. Um, that, that seems to be one place he could go. And he's done this in the past. If you look at his cabinet ministers, uh, many of the important ones, they came from the LR. They weren't, they weren't pure Macronistes. Um, so I love that. I've never heard that term. Uh, I just Chandler, made it up. Gonna, I just made it up. We're gonna have, there is obviously a group here that would love to chat with you all afternoon, but I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here okay. with our sincere thanks for an absolutely fabulous presentation and discussion. Thank you so very much. This was riveting. Okay, thank you. I've enjoyed doing it. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.